This is Dreaming of His Kiss, a Cowboy Mountain Christmas small town sweet romance. Written by Jesse Gussman. Performed by Jay Dice. Chapter One. I increased the Pitocin, so hopefully that will give Shelly the kick she needs to get her labor going again. It had stalled out. She's been five centimeters for three hours. Penny Liston finished tapping on the iPad and dropped it in the holder. She lifted a brow at Lacey, one of the nurses on duty in the maternity ward at the small hospital in Mistletoe, Arkansas. Penny had only been working at the hospital for a couple of years, but in a small town like this, it didn't take long to get to know everyone and to feel comfortable. Unlike the major hospital in Dallas where she'd come from, there'd been no such thing as a relaxed atmosphere and casual friendships. Everything was on, all the time. Mistletoe, nestled comfortably in the Arkansas Ozarks, was about as far from Dallas, in character if not miles, as one could get. A man's face flashed through her mind before she deliberately pushed it aside. She supposed one never truly forgot their first love. She'd left him, a successful surgeon, although she'd continued to try to live the big hospital rat race and had succeeded for over a decade. She couldn't take it anymore, though. Mistletoe was exactly what she needed. It'd be nice if she had it before my shift was over. I'd love to have a new baby before I go home. Lacey loved what she did. She'd been doing it for almost 40 years. Seeing a new life come into the world never gets old. Penny didn't doubt, from the look on her face, that she meant it, and she had to agree. Being a midwife was as rewarding as anything could possibly be. Except perhaps being a mother to her own children. God had never given her that particular pleasure despite two failed marriages and years of fertility treatments. Penny nodded. I wouldn't mind if it came by then either, since that will mean I'll be able to go home and have supper at my house. Aren't you going to go apply for that volunteer job you were talking about? Lacey asked, settling behind the counter and adjusting the monitor so she could read the numbers. Shelley was the only patient they had on the floor today. There wasn't much to keep track of. Unlike in Dallas, where monitors beeped constantly and there was almost always an emergency to attend to. I really want to, but I've been kind of leaning toward not. Penny checked to make sure the hall was deserted before she walked around the counter and sat down beside Lacey, also at an angle where she could watch the numbers. The Pitocin should kick up the length of the contractions and the intensity, as well as the frequency. Soon. She didn't want to be caught sleeping and have the baby come without being prepared. It was a first baby, so odds were good there would be some long hours of pushing ahead of them. One never knew, though, which was one of the things that kept a midwife on her toes. Every woman was different. Every baby had a different way of coming. It certainly wasn't boring. But you love working with kids, and you said you were looking for an area in which to volunteer. I know. She just wasn't sure she was ready for the responsibility and commitment. It had taken her this long to recover from the stress and burnout of the big city hospital. Mistletoe was an amazing town, and it had soothed her soul and healed her heart, as much as her heart could be healed. The scars would always be there. A shrill beeping interrupted her before she could continue, and she watched the monitor for a minute before clicking on the keyboard to shut the beeping off. False alarm. She considered the monitor without really seeing it. The new pastor that's coming in is in his 50s. I guess I just wonder what in the world someone that old would be coming to mistletoe for. I thought I'd be working with a young, exciting, vibrant preacher who was eager to start a church. Not someone who's as disillusioned as I am and only looking for a quiet place to read and study.
She hadn't quite hit the half-century milestone and didn't hold his age against the new preacher. She just felt it was a little old to have the energy and drive she wanted to be associated with. I don't think he would have put out an ad for someone to help him if he was thinking he was only going to read and study, right? Lacey adjusted the spare thermometer on the shelf in front of her. Yeah, I suppose you're right. The ad had specifically asked for someone who loved children. She assumed that whoever it was, and the town gossips were good, but they weren't good enough to get his name, was looking for someone to help him with the Sunday school and possibly junior church or some kind of Wednesday night club for the kids. There hadn't been details on the paper she'd seen hanging on the bulletin board in the small grocery store. Just an announcement that he was taking over the church, which she knew to have less than 10 members, and was looking for a helper. Interested applicants were supposed to find him at the church before five on weekdays. When the position was filled, the ad would be taken down. I suppose if Shelley has her baby before five, I might walk over and see. Otherwise, I'll just assume it wasn't a job that was meant for me. I know I've already used two of my chances, Lord, but I'd like a third one, please. Ray Steiner knelt at the front of the little church, his arms on the pew, his forehead in his hands. He'd spent a lot of time in that position since he'd arrived in Mistletoe a week before. Eight days prior, he'd performed his last open-heart surgery on a six-hour-old baby, closing a hole in the heart and replacing a malfunctioning tricuspid valve. A complicated surgery, but one that he'd done many times before. It wasn't old hat. Open-heart surgeries never were, but it hadn't been anything out of the ordinary. Then he'd hung up his scalpel, got in his car, and left Chicago, driving to Mistletoe, Arkansas, where he believed the Lord was calling him. This church building and a small farm outside of Mistletoe were his new home. He had colleagues who couldn't believe what he'd done. A world-renowned heart surgeon didn't just up and quit at the prime of his career. He was only 52. He had a lot of years of surgery ahead of him, but he couldn't keep doing it. Not when God had clearly shown him that healing physical hearts wasn't his job anymore. God wanted him working on spiritual hearts. And God didn't want him working on spiritual hearts on some great big world-renowned stage. God had him here in this little town in the Ozarks. There was a time in his life where Race would have totally ignored God and questioned his motives on top of it. Not now. But I'd really like to have someone work with me, Lord. Please, a partner and helpmate. He had no right to ask. He'd already had two. The second woman had cheated on him, left him, and divorced him. That had been the start of him searching for something more in life and what had led him to follow the Lord's leading here. The first one had been the love of his life. Unfortunately, he'd been young and thought his career needed all his time and attention. He'd not treated her right. Becoming a heart surgeon was time-consuming and arduous, and he'd thrown everything he had into it. It hadn't been fair of him to get married in the first place, even if she'd been the perfect woman for him. He'd neglected her, taken advantage of her, and put her at the bottom of every list he had. He couldn't blame her when she said she couldn't take it anymore and walked out. So, yeah, he was asking God for an awful lot. God had already given him a great love, and he'd managed to neglect her to the point where she couldn't take it, making her feel unloved because he put everyone else first good things. No Borders Doctors was a great organization. He performed life-saving surgeries. He had been needed and been doing a good work. But in doing so, he'd shoved everything his wife wanted aside, and basically by his actions had told her that she wasn't as important as the good deeds he was busy doing. 
she would have forgiven him once or twice or even three times. Maybe pushing her aside once or twice would have been excusable. But he'd been so blind, thinking he was such a do-gooder because of all the charity work he was doing. He hadn't realized that his charity work had been done on the shoulders of the woman he loved. He hadn't realized that until years later. At the time, he thought she'd been selfish to walk out. I'll put my heart and soul into building this church, Lord. But I'm asking, begging for a woman to stand beside me and help me while I do it. One that I can love and who will love me like my first wife. That had been his prayer, not his only one, but a big one, for the last six months as he had orchestrated his transition, shifting his patients to his replacement and winding down his surgery schedule. Of course, he prayed for the people in Mistletoe, the surrounding areas, and that he'd be able to help them spiritually. But it all came back to this. He didn't want to do it by himself. I've given up everything, which I know isn't anything in light of eternity, and I know it will be worth it. But if it would be your will, I would really appreciate you sending me a woman to be my helper and soulmate. His first wife had been the closest thing to a soulmate he'd ever had. Maybe if he hadn't been so young and stupid, blind, focused on doing good for everybody else. At the time, he hadn't realized or even understood exactly why she was leaving him. With the clarity of hindsight, he got that he put everyone else first and, in doing so, made her feel like last, when she'd been anything but. The door to the church creaked open, and he lifted his head. For a moment, the sunshine shone behind the person walking in, and all he could see was that she appeared to have the figure of a woman and longish hair. He said a quick amen and pushed to his feet. His legs were asleep, and he couldn't feel his toes. He stood still, giving the blood a chance to circulate and return to his limbs. In surgery, he tried to move even if just to shift from one foot to the other, to keep the blood flowing, because it was all too easy to just stay in one spot and to concentrate even for an hour without moving. He'd get lost in the intricacies and awe-inspiring magnitude of being inside another human's body, never something he took lightly, not like some other surgeons he'd worked with, although he'd worked with really good people as well. The church was dim because he hadn't turned any lights on, and it was evening in December. The days were short. The person walking toward him was blurred at first. Definitely a woman, though. Is she the answer to my prayer? He'd been hoping that the woman who answered the ad asking for someone who loved children and was willing to help with them and other things around the church and ministry would also be the one the Lord had for him hoping and praying. It just seemed like such a big job to do by himself. In surgery, he was never alone. Yeah, he was the point man, and he was used to that and comfortable with it. But he also always had a team. He could do this, this church building and ministry and whatever else God had for him, whatever other doors opened. But he wanted to be a team even if it was only a team of two. Hello, can I help you? The person seemed to stumble, then they stopped. His legs were still tingling, but at least he could feel the whole way down to his toes, so he stepped around the pew and started down the aisle, intending to meet the person halfway. But their next words stopped him. Race? The voice was husky and familiar. Is that you? He could name every nerve in his body, and every single one of them hummed with shock waves of electricity burning up through his back and sides and out his arms. His brain lit up, and he'd obviously forgotten to breathe because the church tilted and swayed. His heart kicked back in, and his lungs started working overtime to make up for what they'd missed. He reached out to steady himself on a pew 
Penny? Chapter 2 The woman didn't say anything for a moment, like she was trying to figure out, as he was, exactly what was going on. Only she would be more confused. If it were Penny, she would have no idea why he would be here. But it couldn't be his first wife. The last he'd heard, she'd been working in Dallas and married to the owner of a minor league baseball team. I'm looking for the pastor of the church. Penny had recovered, and her voice was professional, with none of the shocked wonder, and it was longing, that had shaded it before. Maybe he had a little harder time getting his emotions under control, because he didn't think he'd ever fallen out of love with her, despite the second marriage. But she had been justified in her leaving, and he hadn't tried to look her up, hadn't fought the divorce. I'm the pastor. He wanted to explain and to tell her everything that had been going on, but he had no reason to believe she'd be interested. So he left it at that short statement and stood, with his hands hanging down the sides, waiting. A quick breath, and then silence rang out in the small sanctuary. His heart thumped hard and loud. It wouldn't surprise him if she could hear it. She still had the piece of it that he'd given her all those years ago. Unless she'd thrown it away. He tried to gather his thoughts. There were a lot of reasons she could be here. But the one that came to his head, and the one his brain latched onto like carbon dioxide on a red blood cell, was that she was answering his ad. But that would mean that she lived in mistletoe. Information he hadn't known. Maybe she wouldn't believe that he didn't know. But she would have no reason to think he was lying. He hadn't kept up with her. He couldn't stand to, couldn't stand to see that she'd married someone else, that she had the family she'd always wanted with another man. The one race hadn't given her, because he'd been so busy doing good things for other people. If he knew Penny, that silence meant she was trying to think of how she could get out of this without hurting his feelings. She must have been here for the job. I put up a few flyers around town asking for someone to help me with the children here. Maybe you're here for that? He hoped so. Please? Where's Pastor Dunkel? She hadn't answered his question. He's still here. I didn't know for sure when I'd be able to come as I wrapped things up with my practice, so he hadn't made any announcements. He'll be here for a little bit to help me get my sea legs, and then he and his wife are retiring. There were only a few members left in the church, and Pastor Dunkel had been holding on by his fingernails. Chances were good that this wasn't the church that Penny went to, if she even went. Back when they'd been married, she'd never missed a service. He'd been less faithful, always busy. With the clarity that hindsight brings, he wondered how many times she'd sat in church by herself, wishing her husband was beside her. She went to a lot of places alone while he'd been busy with other things. I was thinking about the ad, but... Yeah, he didn't have trouble finishing that sentence. He wanted to say the words out loud, but he wanted to give her the chance to speak as well. So he waited. If the hospital here in Mistletoe is putting in a cardiology department, I hadn't heard about it. They're not. Not that he knew of, anyway. So you're working down in Smithville? She named the larger town further to the south and more out of the Ozarks. No. You're not doing surgery anymore? Did you open a practice? No and no. I hung up my scalpel last week. Like I said, I'm the new preacher. You're here in Mistletoe to be a preacher? There was disbelief in her voice. The same disbelief that had been in everyone else's voices whenever he'd said he was quitting. Successful heart surgeons didn't just quit. <laughs>
not unless God told them to. Even then, most would just laugh at the idea that God wanted them to do something. He was probably close to the only heart surgeon in the history of mankind who had given it all up. Other men had given up much more to follow Christ. He believed the sacrifice was worth it. I know it would be kind of hard for you to believe, but yes, the Lord's been working on my heart for a while, not just about this, but about other things. How badly he'd treated her was one of those things. She hadn't cheated like his second wife. He'd treated his second wife a lot better than he'd treated Penny. But yes, I'm here in Mistletoe. This is my church and ministry, and I'm looking for someone to help me. He added that last because he wanted to prompt her. Sometimes, most of the time, he didn't understand the way God worked. God had obviously brought him into mistletoe, which was where his ex-wife was. God had a plan, no doubt. Was it so far-fetched to think that God thought that maybe they could get back together? Maybe that wasn't far-fetched to God, but Penny obviously wasn't interested. I had been thinking about it, but upon further reflection, I've changed my mind. She turned and started walking down the aisle, not even giving him the courtesy of finishing her words while looking into his face. I wish you the best. I hope things work out for you. She'd hit the back of the aisle and turned. Only a few more steps and she'd be walking out the door. Wait. He had no idea what he was going to say, but he didn't want her to leave him. Not without giving him a chance to... To what? Beg her to stay? He hadn't even begged her to stay when she'd walked out of their marriage. Maybe he should have. But he'd been too proud, too hurt at her perceived rejection. What he hadn't realized was that she'd been putting up with his rejection for years. She stopped, her head down, but she didn't turn around. The flyers have been up for a week, and you're the first person who stopped in. I'd appreciate it if you'd reconsider. She took two long breaths before she turned slowly, putting a hand on the back of the pew and tapping it with her finger, watching the appendage go up and down. Was she working at the hospital in Mistletoe? Was she still delivering babies? Working as a midwife? Where was her husband? She had her left hand on the pew. No ring. The sight gave him hope. Twenty years ago, when they were first married, Penny had been sweet. She'd have done anything for him. He could count on her for a smile, even a giggle. As the years of their marriage ground out, she grew less inclined to smile and harder somehow, like she was protecting herself. He thought he saw a little bit of the young girl that she used to be peeking out as they talked, but when she looked at him, her eyes were hard. She crossed her arms over her chest. I walked in here thinking that God wanted me in this position. I wouldn't have come here otherwise. Her lips pursed and her finger tapped on the back of the pew again. He could see her struggle. He stopped waiting. But you had no idea that it was me who was asking for help. It was his turn to purse his lips, or you would have told God no and never set foot in this building. Maybe his straight talk took her aback. He'd never been good at beating around the bush, and as a surgeon, he had to be decisive and sure. That had always been his personality. She lifted her chin, probably because she knew that it shouldn't have mattered who was in the church when she set foot in it. If God was asking her to do it, she should just do it. That's right. That's exactly right. She said the last line softly, and her voice trailed off at the end. Maybe pain, maybe memories but some kind of acknowledgement that there was a history between them. One that meant she didn't want to have to face him on a regular basis. Mistletoe isn't that big, 
You're not going to be able to avoid me forever. I don't have to work with you, though. We've tried that. It didn't work. Maybe I'm different. Maybe I've changed. I'm sure you have. I know I have. He took a couple steps toward her, but stopped when she tensed, like she was getting ready to turn and run. Probably smart. There'd always been sparks between them. They had never gotten to the point in the marriage where that heat had settled down into a nice, steady, glowing ember. But the attraction hadn't been enough. Because of him, he could take full responsibility for it. She'd put everything into their marriage, and he'd put less than nothing. He'd taken, always figuring that eventually, with the money that he made, her sacrifice would be worth it. If he even thought about her sacrifice at all, which, he had to admit, he really hadn't. Maybe it would be different this time. The subject had been them working together, but always, in the back of his head, he'd wished for another chance with Penny. Maybe he was thinking a relationship would be different this time as well. Not that she looked like she was the slightest bit interested in discussing a relationship. He affected her. That much was obvious. Her tells were all there. The tapping finger, the crossed arms, protecting herself and her heart. The pursed lips and trailing words. Yeah, she felt something. He didn't know if they could have a second chance even if they should. His personality had always been decisive. You're not wearing a ring. Her eyes dropped and her lips flattened. It was an intrusive statement, but he couldn't stop himself from saying it. He needed to know. If she were married, he might have to tell her he couldn't work with her anyway. He'd been fighting the urge to walk over to her and touch her since she walked in and he realized who it was. He couldn't work with a married woman having to fight that every day. Mistletoe might be too small for both of them if Penny were married. No, the next one didn't work out any better than you. My second one didn't either. Probably the same problems as you had with me, only she cheated. She was pregnant with his kid when she left me. They have two pretty little girls now. Not that he kept tabs on her, either. She just happened to be a cardiologist in the same hospital as he. Which had been awkward at times, he couldn't lie. She tilted her head as though acknowledging his words, but didn't say anything. What was there to say? They hadn't worked out with each other, and they hadn't worked out with other people. There was lots of failure between them, marriage failure. He had a successful career, and so did she, he assumed. Are you still delivering babies? Yes. There was a sadness in that word, which prompted another question from him. You never had children? No. She watched her finger now like it was doing more than just tapping on the back of the pew. His heart twisted. That was the one thing she wanted more than anything. Children. Funny, it took me until I hit my fifties before I thought how much I wish life had turned out differently. I look around my empty house and know that it should have been filled up with children. I know I could have had it with you. I'm sorry. For what it's worth. He'd never apologized. After she walked out, they hadn't communicated at all except through their lawyers. There had been no need. Everything was pretty cut and dry. They sold their house, split it all, and walked away. They hadn't even had a pet to fight about. Pretty sad for ten years of marriage. But she'd supported him through med school and residency and the beginning of his fledgling career in cardiac surgery. Maybe that was it that the promises that he'd made to her through all those other years, where he'd said when he was finally a surgeon, he'd make time for her. Maybe it was those broken promises she couldn't take anymore. Maybe she just finally realized he was never going to make time for her. Or maybe it was that last fight, 
where she'd said she wanted children, and he'd said he wasn't ready. Like he'd been saying for the past ten years. There's enough blame to go around for both of us. She kept her head down, but finally looked up. I'm sorry, too, for what it's worth. I made a vow, and I didn't keep it. That's on me. I broke a lot of promises. He took a breath to say more, but she held up her hand. Stop. We don't need to rehash the whole thing. It's over and done with. I've moved on, and I'm sure you have too. It will just start hurting again if we dig it all up. You're probably right about that, but I'd feel better if we got it out and I got to apologize and tell you what I've learned. She shook her head. <laughs> this isn't a post-op recap. This is real life. My life. I don't want you to dissect it and have you tell me the lessons you've learned for next time. Thanks anyway. She turned to go. Consider helping me. He could hear her blow out the breath that she'd been holding. Every line of her posture said that she didn't want to be here. Didn't want to be helping him. But he also knew she wasn't here because of what she wanted. She was here because the Lord wanted her here. Now her internal fight was whether she would do what God wanted or what she wanted. He supposed, when she'd walked out on him, she'd won that battle for herself because she'd done what she wanted rather than sticking through the hard times. He couldn't have said if those hard times would have gotten any better, though. After all, nothing had changed after Penny walked and he'd lost another wife to the same complaint. She looked over at the top of a side window and sighed. <sighs> I can help. Spoken like she was a martyr going to the stake. But I can't be dependable because I'm on call at the hospital. It was a small hospital, and he couldn't imagine that there were so many women having babies that her being on call was ever more than a trip to the hospital in the middle of the night once or twice a month. He didn't say that. Instead, he allowed the gratitude he felt to come out of his mouth. Thank you. I can tell you don't want to, but I do think we will be doing a good work here. She jerked her head, still facing away from him. He pushed a little. Maybe we can work out a time to get together and talk about what needs to be done? One shoulder lifted, but she didn't turn to look at him. Sure. Not now. I need to go. Needed to or wanted to? He suspected the latter but didn't question the former. Okay. You name the time. This is my job. I'll make it work. Tomorrow at five. That's great. He paused. I've been trying to save money on heating the church. Would you like to meet at Mountain Moons? He asked, naming the diner in town. Her head jerked back around. I'm not going out on a date with you. I didn't ask you to. I told you I was saving money by not heating the church. It'll be warmer at the diner. People will see us together. Maybe you haven't been in a small town long enough, but that's enough to link us. She crossed her arms again. I don't want that. Okay, that was fair, and he couldn't blame her. Do you want to come with me to visit a kid in Nellysville Saturday? He's actually a little boy that I operated on several years ago. She hesitated and his heart stumbled. Maybe she would see this as more of him sidelining her, bringing her along, then ignore her as he did more important things. But she said, Sure, unless someone goes into labor, I should be available. Where do you want to meet? If meeting here will suit you, that works for me. That's where I'll be anyway. That's fine. Her foot tapped. I guess you'll want to give me your phone number, because while there aren't a lot of babies delivered, I'm the only one aside from the obstetrician at the hospital who delivers babies. So if there's a woman in labor, I'll have to be there. 
He understood that. He'd never worked at a small hospital, but he understood about hospitals and being on call. He rattled off his phone number, feeling in his heart that God was doing some kind of work, but he wasn't sure what. Maybe it was just a matter of reconciliation. Maybe Penny didn't feel the same attraction that he'd always felt toward her. Maybe she didn't think he was her soulmate as he did her, nor long for a companion like he did. Whatever the Lord was doing, Race was going to try to go along with it. He'd come this far. He wasn't going to quit now. Thanks for doing this, Penny. I know it was a shock to see me. I haven't committed to anything. This might not work out. In fact, I can imagine that it won't. But I feel like I need to give it a try, so I will. Sometimes God takes things that you would never think would go together, and when combined, they end up making something beautiful. Her eyes shot back over her shoulder, staring at him. If she caught any hint in his voice that he might be talking about more than surface, non-personal things, she didn't show it. I'll see you then. Chapter 3 Penny walked out of the church, still not over her shock. The very last person she expected to see today was Race. She certainly hadn't expected to see him in a church and find out he was the pastor. That was just way too unbelievable. Certainly far beyond anything she'd ever imagined. She hated that she still felt that pull toward him, the one she'd always felt. He had that magnetic personality, and especially after he'd become one of the top heart surgeons in his field, lots of women were attracted to him. Not that she'd been around to see much of that. When she'd realized that the promises that he made were just as easily broken, there'd been no point in staying. She couldn't believe that anything was different now. He'd never appreciated the people in his life, certainly not as much as he valued and appreciated his accomplishments. She walked with sure strides down the sidewalk and toward the outskirts of town, where Nancy and John Martin had their greenhouse. She wanted to pick up several poinsettias for her home. Christmas was only four weeks away, but she liked to wait until after Thanksgiving before decorating. She made it in with 15 minutes to spare before closing and was greeted warmly by Nancy. My little granddaughter is doing amazing. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful experience for Naomi. She just raves about how she loved her time in the hospital. Who ever heard of anyone enjoying their hospital stay? Nancy's matronly figure came around the makeshift shelves filled with various colors of poinsettias, along with baskets of Christmas flower arrangements. She wrapped her arms around Penny and gave her a huge hug. This was a part of delivering babies. It was something that touched so many lives in a positive way, and people were appreciative and grateful, usually. There were the few deliveries that went horribly wrong. Thankfully, they were not the norm. They chatted for a bit more about Naomi and her recovery before Nancy leaned in closer and looked both ways around the empty store. Did you see the handsome new preacher? I heard he was single. Oh boy, she'd never been faced with this problem before. Should she admit that the handsome new preacher was her ex-husband? She didn't want to, but Mistletoe was a small town, and it would come out. He is handsome. That was an absolute truth. Race had been blessed with great looks, superior intelligence, and a determined drive that almost guaranteed his success in whatever he did. I was married to him for a while, a decade ago or so. Nancy gasped, a long, sustained sound that had Penny wanting to smack her on the back and dislodge whatever was caught in her throat. Her eyes were as big as the leaves on the pond that mirrored over along the side of the greenhouse. 
No way. That's your ex? When Penny had first moved to Mistletoe, she'd just been a year out of her second divorce. He's one of them. I was married twice. Two marriages and no children. That reeked. She'd gone through all the heartache and work of marriage and didn't even have any of God's promised blessings to show for it. How many other women's babies had she delivered? And she'd never given birth to one of her own. Never had the joy of a toothless smile or chubby little arms wrapping around her neck. She even would have welcomed the attitude of a teenager. Just a child, or children, whatever, a house full of love and laughter. It had never been hers. Nancy's face softened into a pitying look. Oh, I didn't realize you'd been married twice. Of course not. It wasn't something that Penny had gone around telling everyone. Plus, in some circles, race was practically famous. Some people might think she was crazy for walking away from a man like that. Although he'd remarried, not even two years after she left, so obviously he'd gotten over her pretty quickly. I probably didn't mention it. It was a long time ago. Well, I guess you'll be avoiding that, Church, Nancy said with a wink. I had been thinking about going since I'd heard there was a new preacher coming. I wanted to show support. But obviously, it's more important that I support you. Well, you can support me by going, because I just came from meeting him, and I'm going to be helping him with the children in the church. She felt God's call clearly. He wanted her there. If it hadn't been clear and strong, she would have walked out of the church and away from race in a heartbeat. No amount of his sweet talking would have changed anything. Oh, so you guys split amicably. Penny shrugged. They hadn't fought. They never fought. Although there had been a deep passion that burned brightly between them, it had never morphed into anger. There was just hurt on her part and nothing on his. Neglect was his specialty. Neglect for her while he paid attention to the rest of the world. Maybe she shouldn't have left. It wasn't like he was abusing her or cheating. Race would never do either of those two things. But she'd just been so lonely. It was like she was married but single, with all the loneliness that went with singlehood. She'd had such a hard time facing the rest of her life thinking that that was all there was. Now, looking back through the eyes of an older woman, who maybe was a little bit wiser, she wasn't sure that leaving him had been the right decision. She'd broken sacred vows simply because she was unhappy. She could justify it. She should be allowed to be happy. But there was no way she could support that decision with scripture. It was done and over with. She couldn't take it back. We never fought. He's a good man. All true. He was good to everyone else. If Nancy was curious about what made them split, she didn't ask. Which was surprising, because if Penny had learned anything about the small town, it was that everybody knew everything about everyone else, and if they didn't, they made it their duty to find it out. Thankfully, Nancy wasn't going to dig today. Remember three years ago at Christmas, when there was that bad car accident and those parents of the six kids were killed? Penny scrunched her face up. That would have been just about the time she arrived. And yeah, she couldn't forget it. Yes, what a horrible accident. The children were at home, but they lost both parents. It had been in the papers for days. The kids were all farmed out to various relatives, Nancy continued, waving her hand in the air. I only know this because my husband's sister is the best friend of the aunt of the woman who was killed. Penny wasn't sure she followed that, 
but she'd lived here long enough that she was pretty sure it didn't matter. Nancy was just letting her know that it wasn't gossip. It was family information. Yes? Well, the kids, the oldest one is 17, have all got together, and they petitioned the state to find them a home where they can all be together. Nothing is going to come of it because the state can't make someone take a whole family like that. But it's been making the news. Because it's so unusual for a kid to take charge like that. Nancy shook her head. Those kids had a lot of potential, too. Losing their parents has been devastating for them. I've heard some of them are acting out. One of them was actually busted with drugs and did some time in juvie. This last part was said with a lowered voice and another glance around the deserted greenhouse. Penny had actually fostered several children, and she knew some state workers. But her job made it almost impossible for her to be any good at being a foster mom. She was constantly getting sitters and going out all hours of the night. As much as she wanted to have children, fostering them by herself hadn't been the way to go. There was no way she could handle six. Although she'd take them in a heartbeat if she could. She wasn't scared of the number or the ages. It's just so hard to get people to take teenagers. You just don't know whether you can trust them or not. Nancy leaned closer and she handed Penny her change. I have little bags I can put those in if you want me to. If you would, please. I'm walking and that will make them easier to carry. Even their own relatives don't want to do that. Six kids. Who can do that? Nobody in their right mind has more than two. Maybe three. Any more and you're just asking to be broke and insane. Children, take your brain cells and eat them for dessert. Nancy lowered her voice into a fake, spooky sound, and then she and Penny laughed, even though Penny didn't really agree with her. Kids weren't bad. They just needed love and discipline, maybe some structure and encouragement. They chatted a little more about their Christmas plans before Penny said goodnight to her and walked out with Nancy closing the door and flipping the sign to closed behind her. Even though they were in the Ozarks, Winters weren't unbearably cold, and snow wasn't terribly common. Penny couldn't say she missed it, except possibly this time of year. Snow would make the Christmas lights that were up in a long line on the light poles on both sides of the street sparkle even prettier. It seemed to take away some of the dirt and grime and just add a pristine blanket of freshness to everything. Not that Mistletoe was a dirty town, far from it. It was small, and people took pride in their town. Even if most people were hardworking and didn't have a lot of extra cash, it didn't cost anything to pick up trash and sweep the sidewalk. It didn't cost anything to help their neighbor, and that was something else that could be depended upon in the small town. Penny hadn't lacked for anything and had been accepted with open arms when she came. Of course, that again probably had something to do with her job. When a person delivered someone's baby and things went well, they had a tendency to remember that person and think well of them. She was thinking about that and not paying attention as she walked out onto the sidewalk and right into the path of a jogger. He'd seen her at the last possible second and managed to mostly avoid her, preventing a painful impact but not a complete collision. Both of them ended up on the sidewalk on their butts. Thankfully, her bags protected her poinsettias, although they had both fallen onto their sides. Excuse I'm me, so sorry. I didn't mean. She brushed her ponytail out of her face and stared into the eyes of her ex husband, eyes that were quite familiar to her at one time. They'd had a painful gulf between them, but there had always been that passion. She'd stared into those eyes at night in bed more than once and wished that she'd been more to him, more than someone he spent time with after the lights went out. Still, those memories were mostly sweet. She could almost feel the comfortable weight of his body, see the lowering of his head, feel the stubble of his cheek brushing hers. <laughs>
their hands and legs entwined. That's it. I'm calling an ambulance. You must have hit your head. No. Penny blinked her eyes, bringing her mind back to the present. I'm fine. I'm sorry. I was thinking about something, and I didn't hear you. I'm really fine. Did you ask? Yeah. Isn't that what someone usually asks when they run into someone else? Ray stood, gracefully competent, completely in charge of his limbs, as he was his hands during the most intricate of surgeries. He held one of those hands out to her. Even, or maybe especially, his hands brought back memories. She looked at that hand, glowing red and green and white with the Christmas light sparkling from the street lamp. Long fingers, white palm. She knew how it felt and knew what it did to her heart when he touched her. But not taking it now would be rude. She should have scrambled up. Grabbing one of the poinsettia bags, she handed it to him, almost hooking it on his fingers before he curled them around it and took it from her. While he was shifting it into his other hand, she tried to get her body adjusted, definitely not as graceful and competent as him. It had never bothered her that he was so much better than she was in so many areas. She cheered him on, encouraged him when he came stumbling home from the hospital after a particularly bad night. Cancer patients, children dying, the ones that he should have been able to save but couldn't. The heartbreak and the loss. The struggle to be good enough and the question as to whether he ever would be. She'd been there through it all. She'd given everything she could, everything she had to him, knowing he had what it took to be the best at what he did. He had become the perfect and amazing surgeon that she had always known he would. She'd been left with nothing because she'd given it all away to him. Maybe that wasn't entirely true, but that was how she felt. She wouldn't have walked otherwise. Chapter 4 Ray shifted the poinsettia into his other hand, and when she looked up, his hand was still out for her. Without a word, she handed him the other poinsettia. Again, he shifted it immediately and had his hand back out for her before she could get up. Sucking in the kind of soul-sustaining breath that reached clear to her little toes, she held her hand out and grabbed his. It was just as she had suspected. All the sparks and electricity were still there. Also, oddly, in his hands, she'd almost always been able to feel the healing there. It was a gift that had been given. God had smiled on him. She could feel it. It was still there, too. He might have said he had hung up his scalpel, but the gift was still in his hands. Pulling on him as little as possible, she got her feet under her and stood. Back in their younger days, she wouldn't have used his strength at all, but life had a way of catching up to one. Being in her late forties had her slowing down some. Are you sure you're okay? He bent down as she stood, trying to look into her eyes. She avoided his gaze, brushing her pants off and making a show of dusting off her hands. She held her hands out for the poinsettias. I can take them now, thank you. Is this the best place to get these? He asked, nodding his head toward the store she'd just exited and which was now closed. Nancy has always treated me well and she grows the best plants in town. It wasn't that big of a town, but it was still saying something. I've been thinking of decorating the church. You know I'm not good with that kind of thing. His voice kind of trailed off, and this is where, if she were a normal person, she would be volunteering to help or even do it herself. She loved doing stuff like that. She'd noticed yesterday when she was in there it was kind of bare. That was before she'd realized race was who he was. Decorating the church would be a lot of fun. She pressed her mouth closed, 
decorating the church would get her into closer proximity with race, the opposite of her end goal. But the man had spent ten years with her, and he still knew her a little better than what she would have given him credit for. I know you enjoy that kind of thing. How many times did you paint our kitchen? Four? Three. Although she had been considering doing it a fourth time, she'd walked out on him instead. She did, however, clamp her mouth closed on the sentence that she wanted to add to that three, which was she'd painted because she had so much time on her hands and nothing else to do after she got home from delivering babies, because her husband was always so busy doing things for other people. Okay, three. He smiled just a little the corners of his mouth curving up. That was something else that had dwindled down to nothing in the last years of their marriage. They never smiled or laughed together. His job had been serious, of course, and she couldn't blame him. He saw a lot of death and dying, sadness and tragedy. Who was she to complain that he didn't laugh with her enough? But she would needed the laughter and the intimacy of a shared smile and a joke between the two of them. Still, she couldn't look at his smile without the corners of her own mouth turning up. I think that's a yes. You'll help me decorate the church. How about I don't help you, I just do it. There. She tried to put a teasing note in her voice, so it didn't sound like she was stiff-arming him, although she was. She didn't want to spend that much time with him. If she was going to help, she'd do her thing and he could do his. It was the only way her heart was going to survive. Can I carry these somewhere for you? He held up the poinsettia he still had in his hand. She reached for it. No, thank you. I'm just going home and it's not that far. She had her business face on again. She didn't want him to feel like he could push into her time or space. He handed the poinsettia over without further comment. As she took it, their eyes met, her heart stilled, the night stopped, and all she saw was him gazing down at her, like he had a hundred times before. Powerful memories threatened to surge up and swamp her with her emotion and intensity and pull her along directly toward him where she didn't want to go. That way lay heartache. She ripped her eyes away. I'll see you Saturday, he asked softly, almost gently. I said I would be there. She didn't turn around, continuing to place one solid foot in front of another. She had no idea why God had led her to the church and to volunteer for the position that was open but she knew she couldn't take another heartbreak like the disintegration of her first marriage had caused. Race jogged to the church where he'd left his car. Rather than go home and change, he'd taken his jog as soon as he'd been done with work for the day. Now he was ready for a shower and to fix his mind on something else aside from studying and thinking about the church. Except he couldn't put Penny out of his mind. She no longer looked like the young girl he'd married. She'd matured and gotten older, just as he had. He actually liked and respected her more this way, although he missed her eager-to-please attitude and easy smile and free laughter. She had become a woman of dignity and purpose who carried herself like someone who knew her worth. Delivering babies all through the years probably had something to do with that. It was a hard job, long hours, in difficult positions. Not like a laid-out body on a table the way it was when he did surgery. He'd been in delivery. It took patience and time, half medical expertise, half human expertise, where Penny would deal with a mother in pain and an anxious father in a room full of medical workers and possibly even family. Getting jarred from sleep in the middle of the night was normal. Beyond her job, Penny had always been a good person. Just look at her, the only person in town who'd responded to his ad.
Race was going to the back door of the church to run in and grab his bag when he met Pastor Dunkel, the retiring pastor, coming out. Coming back in to do some more work? The pastor said in his rough but soothing voice. No, I left my bag here and I'm picking it up. I thought I saw someone here today. Was it someone answering your ad? The pastor and his wife still lived in the manse beside the church. As far as race was concerned, they could have it until the church either was closed and foreclosed, or until they died. Hopefully the former didn't happen, and the latter took a long time. Yes. With another man, he wouldn't have said anything more. But this was Pastor Dunkel. It was my ex-wife. She actually lives here in Mistletoe. I didn't even know. It was a shock to see her, that was for sure. He rubbed the back of his neck. Shock was putting it mildly. It wasn't an unpleasant shock, though. Pastor Dunkel's eyes held wisdom that race could only hope to attain someday. Sometimes the Lord puts people together for a reason. He chuckled dryly. <laughs> Sometimes it's not the reason we think. She's definitely not interested in picking up a relationship with me anytime soon, if that's what you're thinking. She agreed to take the job, but she doesn't want to have anything to do with me. I can't blame her. I didn't treat her well when we were married. I can't imagine you hitting a woman. The pastor's eyes furrowed behind his round glasses. Ray shook his head emphatically. No, never. I just neglected her. Shoved her aside because I thought there were a lot of other things that were more important. You have nothing but time now and opportunity. Winning her heart again will definitely take time. But you can show her now that you won't do that again. Maybe that's what the Lord has for you. Maybe. He couldn't imagine how he could show her now that he wouldn't shove her aside. His life wasn't nearly as busy as it was when he was a cardiologist. I'm off to the house. The wife will have supper ready for me. Thanks, Pastor Dunkel. I'll see you tomorrow, probably. The pastor raised his hand and walked off. Race walked to his car. Before he reached it, his phone buzzed, and he pulled it out of his pocket. Hello? Race, this is Mahan Tuttle. Race recognized the name of a cardiac surgeon associate of his in Chicago. One he'd worked with before, although not closely. I'm sorry to bother you, but I wanted to inform you of an opportunity that has come up with No Borders Doctors. It's a special emergency trip, open only to doctors who've done it before and can get the paperwork in line in order to fly out quickly. It'll be on an as-needed basis, but the trips will be spontaneous. The man cleared his throat. I thought, since you've slowed down with your schedule, you might be interested in becoming part of something like this. It'll help keep your credentials updated, but it won't be a big time suck. No pressure. Race paced back and forth before stopping and staring up at the sky. Thanks for considering me. I do have other things going on, but I would give this some consideration, because this has always been dear to my heart. When do I have to let you know by? Two weeks from Saturday, Mahan said immediately, like he'd memorized all the information, which he probably had. I'm getting names, and I'm going to turn in a pool of doctors from which they will call when a trip is necessary. Okay, I'll let you know by then. Is this a number to get back to you on? Yes, this is perfect. They hung up, and Race considered whether this was something that the Lord wanted him to do. Maybe he'd hung up his scalpel, not to start a ministry, but to have more time to volunteer worldwide. He hadn't thought of that. The idea was intriguing. He would definitely keep it in mind. Chapter 5 Saturday morning, Race was at the church early. There were not a whole lot of people who attended services, but he still prayed over every seat and every face 
and even for the people that weren't there but that he hoped to have. He also prayed for a good trip with Penny. Since he'd seen her earlier in the week, he hadn't been able to stop thinking about her and wondering if this was part of the reason that God brought him to mistletoe. Everything seemed so clear when he was back in Chicago. God wanted him to stop working on physical hearts and start working on spiritual ones. It seemed cut and dried. But now that he was here, no borders doctors were calling, Penny was here, and the church only had enough finances to stay open another month. He could take his own personal money and pay the utilities in Pastor Dunkel's small retirement salary, but it wasn't sustainable, and he wasn't sure that was something that would be in God's will anyway. He'd bought a little farm, and this time of year there wasn't much work to do on it, but he didn't want to spend all of his money and have nothing for whatever it was that farmers needed to spend money on. Since he wasn't a farmer yet, he wasn't sure, but he wanted to learn. Penny pulled in early, and he'd been listening, ready to walk out when she got there. She didn't get out of her car, so he walked over. She put the window down, and he bent over. Do you want to ride with me? He asked. How about you ride with me? She lifted her brow, and he felt like it was a challenge. He was a control freak. He had never met a surgeon who wasn't. You almost had to be. It was like a requirement for the job. He hadn't spent too much time in his life trying to overcome that tendency. He didn't really think that was what had bothered Penny about their marriage before anyway. He almost kind of thought she liked it. Shut your car off and come over with me. I'll drive, he said. The humor in her eyes grew before she closed her window and shut off her car. <laughs> yeah, he didn't think that was upsetting her. He walked over to the passenger side of his car and waited. Finally, after gathering up her purse and a jacket, she walked over, still hiding a little smirk. He smirked right back. It's okay. Go ahead and make fun of me. You know you want to. What? I would never make fun of your overbearing and controlling tendencies, and it would be rude to mention them. Yes, very rude. That's why I would never. He opened the door wider, and she lifted her brow even higher before she sat down. He had to laugh. After all the years of being respected for being the serious and competent surgeon that he was, it was kind of refreshing to not have the bowing and scraping in front of him. He closed her door, already looking forward to spending the morning with her. He walked around and settled into his seat. As he put his seatbelt on, he said, You know, if you'd insisted on driving, I would have let you. She pursed her lips together and gave him a sideways look. Really? I'm doubting that. No, really. I'm turning over new leaves. One lip pulled back before she looked straight ahead again, crossing her arms over her chest. A defensive posture, and it hurt his heart. He'd hurt her. And she felt like she needed to protect herself from him. He supposed he could understand that. I'm not exactly inviting these people to church, but this is a little boy that I operated on a few years ago. They sent me an email, and I realized that they weren't that far from me. Since I'm in the area, I thought I would stop and see them. It had just seemed like a nice gesture at the time. I'm sure that'll make, if not the little boy's day, at least the parents. It's not every day you have the surgeon come to your house and visit. Her words were right, but her voice had a little bit of a flat tone in it, and he wondered about that. Maybe she wouldn't tell him about it, but he could try. It almost sounds like you resent the fact that I'm going to see them. No, I don't resent that. It's just the kind of thing that you would do. Something still wasn't right. You don't sound very happy about it. Her arms pulled tighter around her chest, and her eyes slanted sideways at him. Really, Penny, tell me. You can be honest and play straight with me. I won't get upset. <laughs>
so quickly he almost missed it. A flash of pain tightened her features before her lips pressed together, and she shrugged. It just sounds childish when I say it, but after years of you constantly doing all these sweet, kind things for other people and pushing me aside, I guess I do kind of resent the kindness you show everyone else other than your wife. But since I'm not your wife anymore, it shouldn't matter. He rolled those words over in his head. He didn't have an argument for them, because she was right. He'd seen plenty of men who were drunkards and jerks and neglected their wife and kids in order to go running off with other women or to get drunk or high. It was tempting to point out that at least he hadn't done that. But at the same time, neglect was neglect. Just because he was running off doing good things didn't make it any easier for her to sit at home alone. He would take full responsibility for that. But a part of him felt that she wasn't perfect either. He gritted his teeth, feeling like the words he was going to say would make him vulnerable. I always resented the fact that it was so easy for you to leave. Her eyes widened, her arms uncrossed, and her fists balled. Easy? You thought that was easy? It was the hardest thing I ever did but I don't feel like I had a choice. We could have worked it out. You didn't even try. She'd hurt him with how simple she'd made it. Pack and leave. How could I try when you were never there? He made himself breathe rather than shooting off a hot retort. Had that really been the problem? Had he really not even been there for her to talk to? He swallowed. I made a point of being there every Sunday morning. We ate breakfast, and we went to church together. Unless there was a major emergency that I absolutely could not control, and that didn't happen very often. Her features relaxed some. No, you're right, she said, giving him that point. You were there on Sunday mornings, but I didn't want to ruin the one time of the week we had to spend together by starting an argument or complaining. His hand gripped the wheel tighter. But if there was a problem, you needed to say something. If the only time that you see me all week long I'm complaining about something, that's not good for us either. I didn't want to be that memory. Okay, he could see that too. But still, since you didn't say anything, I didn't know. I would agree with that, except surely there was some part of you that thought maybe you'd like to do something with your wife. I mean, if I have to beg you to want to do things with me or spend time with me, isn't that kind of defeating the purpose? Her jaw clenched, and she stared straight ahead, making him think that this had really hurt her like her easy leaving had hurt him. We make time for what we want to make time for, right? And when you didn't make time for me, I could complain about it, but it wouldn't change the fact that you didn't want it. He'd never considered their relationship from that point of view before. It made sense, though. She didn't want him to just spend time with her. She wanted him to want to spend time with her. Logically, a husband should want to spend time with his wife. Obviously, it wasn't something she felt she had to beg for. He blew out a breath. <sighs> I can see that. I can see that you wanted me to want you and not just spend time with you out of duty because you complained about it. Exactly. But can you see that I wanted you to stay and fight because what we had meant something to you? And by fighting for it, you showed that. And for you to not just leave because you gave up. He lifted a hand from the steering wheel and waved it in the air. I'd felt like I'd been blindsided because I didn't even know there was a problem. And it felt like you didn't care because you didn't talk about it. You just walked away. Her shoulders slumped a little, and he figured up until this point, she'd considered everything his fault. 
He was willing to shoulder the majority of the blame because she was right. It really was his. He was the one who had neglected her and not made sure she felt like she was important to him. But he felt he had a point, too. Her chest moved up and down, and her face pointed out the window, watching the tree-backed fields and the gently rolling hills slide by under a gray winter sky. I'm sorry, you're right. I guess I took your neglect and your silence as a verdict, and I didn't give you a chance to actually think about it and make a decision. She paused. I made the decision for both of us. Her eyes crinkled and she tilted her head. I didn't mean it that way, but that was probably hard for you, wasn't it? Since I'd taken control and made the decision. He shouldn't smile at that, but his lips curved up anyway, because she knew him and had a point. You're probably right. Maybe subconsciously I was upset about that too. He had never thought of it in so many words. He turned off the highway onto a two-lane road, and houses began to appear on each side as they hit the outskirts of Nellysville, where the little boy lived. He spoke carefully, kind of feeling his way. I almost feel like if we were to have just sat down and had a sincere heart-to-heart -heart talk with each other, maybe things would have worked out. She nodded, and he felt a little thrill of victory that she agreed. But then she said, I agree, completely, without reservation. I don't know how many times I'd ask you to talk with me. We'd even planned out weekend getaways, five different times, but you canceled. Probably if we'd gone on one of those, we could have talked about this and worked through it. But you were too busy for that, and the vacations we took consisted of us going back to see the family. Normally, you were on the phone most of the time. She said everything softly. It wasn't like she was accusing him. Since she was giving him that space, he didn't feel defensive and could look back and realize she was right. They'd taken vacations, but they weren't fun vacations designed to draw them closer as a couple. They were vacations that were designed to check the box of, I went to see my family this year. Her voice came even more softly, low. I wanted a baby, children, and you shut that down every time I brought it up. It was something that was really important to me. He knew it. That was always what he'd thought one of her main issues was. He tapped the steering wheel with his finger. Yeah, you're right about that. I wasn't the slightest bit interested in having children. I didn't have time to handle all the things I already had on my plate. The big grain silos of the feed mill that sat in the middle of Nellysville filled up the window, and her head turned, looking out and watching them. It's probably a good thing, because then we would have had kids that had split parents. But you knew when you married me that I wanted children, and yet there was never a discussion about when. It was just a no. I agree. It was a good thing. I would have been a horrible dad. I would have neglected our kids just like I neglected you. Maybe he sounded a little fatalistic, but he was more disgusted with himself than anything. Why was it always so easy to look back and see all the mistakes? He turned his turn signal on and pulled into the driveway of the two-story house that looked very similar to all the other houses on the main street through town. In all the years of his practice, he didn't typically put faces and families with houses and homes, because in his experience, with him getting the sickest of the sick, there were times they didn't make it, and that just made it harder on him. This is the first time you've ever visited a patient at home? Penny looked over at him. It is. I guess you know that's not normally what I do. It did. He corrected himself. I can't believe you gave it all up. I think our discussion on the way here showed clearly that it was probably for the best. I was successful in helping a lot of people, but it was a selfish kind of success. 
Penny's face scrunched up. I don't think the people in this house would agree with that. I would say it's a good kind of success, because their son is alive because of you. Her hand lifted up, and for a second, he almost thought she was going to put it down on his leg. But she didn't, setting it down on the console between them. The same goes for every other life that you saved. Don't be so hard on yourself. You can't be perfect. No one expects you to be. My priorities have shifted. Maybe they should have shifted a long time ago. His voice lowered, and he couldn't keep the emotion out of it. When the person I loved with everything in me walked away from me, you would have thought that would have woken me up. But I still didn't see it. I was still completely clueless. And I did the exact same thing to my second wife. I can see it now. Did she leave you too? Penny asked, her eyes big, like she hadn't known, hadn't kept track of him. Why would she have? She did. Penny nodded. There wasn't a shred of surprise on her face, which prompted questions to fire in his head. You thought about it too, didn't you? Her eyes widened, maybe at the accusatory note and hurt in his tone. He didn't mean to accuse her, but he hadn't thought up until that point that Penny was like his second wife. I was never tempted to cheat. I wanted attention, time, comfort, love, and I suppose all those things would have been offered in the arms of another man, and I can't say the idea didn't pop into my head. But no, I was never tempted. Penny had never lied to him unless one counted the vows that she'd broken when she walked away as lies. So he had no reason to disbelieve her. He looked at the time, two minutes until. They're expecting us. Are you ready? Sure am. He took one last look at her and got out of the car. Chapter 6 Sunday morning when Penny walked into church, attendance went up by a fifth. She recognized Pastor Dunkel, his wife, and of course, Race. The young man with him must be Ethan, the slightly troubled 20-something whom she'd heard was living with him and helping him on the farm. There was a couple that she didn't know. Then herself. That was it. It was hard to believe that Race had left a successful and prestigious position as a cardiac surgeon for this. Race had an excellent message, though, which made her even more sad, because there should have been people in there to hear it. She waited in the back after the service was over and Pastor Dunkel's wife finished up playing the piano. Ethan nodded at her and walked out first. The other couple shook Race's hand and left shortly after. Pastor and Mrs. Dunkel shook hers along with races and spoke to him a few minutes before walking out. She leaned against the back pew as he gathered up his papers and Bible and walked toward her. Most of the time, we have a couple kids. Obviously, they didn't come today. I noticed they weren't here. She pressed her lips together, trying to keep from smiling. You can laugh at me, it's okay. I wasn't laughing at you. I guess I was laughing at what you'd said. Obviously, they weren't here. It did make her wonder what he'd been expecting from her, since the position he'd asked her to fill was helping with the kids. Except there were no kids. He smiled, but it wasn't hard to see the sadness, or maybe it was disappointment, in his eyes. She wanted to fix that, but really, what was she going to do? other than what she was doing. I invited the kids next door to my house, and they couldn't come today, but they said they'd come next week. I'll be bringing them myself. He nodded. Normally I'd pick some kids up, but they weren't going to be home this weekend either. His mouth flattened, and he looked away. Despite herself, Penny's heart hurt for him. When he'd talked to her in the car, She'd realized that maybe all the blame hadn't been his. 
that rather than suffering in silence, waiting and hoping that he'd finally notice her, she should have spoken up and told him what she wanted and what she wasn't getting that she needed. She should have given him a warning that she was getting ready to walk. He'd said he hadn't had a clue, and she believed him. She also had been able to tell, quite clearly, that her leaving had hurt him. Up until that point, she'd thought he hadn't cared and probably hadn't even noticed. Now, Race looked about as dejected as he had yesterday. He wasn't used to not being successful. She supposed it was probably good for him, but it was still hard to watch. He seemed to shake it off as he straightened and his eyes focused on her again. Would you like to go down to the mistletoe madhouse to get a hot dog? If Penny didn't know him so well, she wouldn't have noticed the way his thumb flipped back and forth along the edge of one of the papers that stuck out of his Bible. As a man whose hands were rock steady, that little tell with his thumb spoke volumes about his nervousness. For some reason, it made her feel good that he was nervous about asking her out. Was that what this was? It definitely made it easier for her to say yes. It wasn't like she wanted to go back to her empty house and face the entire Sunday afternoon alone. Sure, I'd love to. She found it was true. There'd never been anyone else in her life that she'd enjoyed spending time with as much as Race. His lips pulled back, and he moved to swing his arm, allowing her to go first. But then he stopped. If you want to drive, you can. She laughed, and the sound echoed through the church. She wasn't sure when the last time was she'd actually laughed out loud. And it wasn't even that it was so funny. It was just the way he said it. It reminded her of the conversation that they'd had. <laughs> no, that's okay. You go right ahead. I suppose if I insist that you drive, that's me controlling again? That's right. So this is a no-win situation for me. Right again, she said with a smirk. Maybe we should just walk. I might be able to come out the winner in that situation somehow. You know, it's not a competition, she said before shrugging. That's fine. It's not that cold out today. I know it's not. I guess my competitive streak is alive and well. She lifted a brow. She'd never been intimidated or upset with race needing to be the best. It was different than her laid backness, but not in a bad way. Deciding to ignore it, she went back to the weather. It's actually nice out for December. It is, not too cold. He stopped at the door and looked back into the sanctuary. You did a really nice job of decorating. You must have done that last night. Yeah, Pastor Dunkel let me in. Give me your receipts and I'll reimburse you for what you spent. No, it's a donation. She didn't have any children and the only expenses she had were her house and utilities. She'd saved a little bit for retirement, and the rest she felt she could give away. She wasn't going to tell him that decorating the church was a part of that. His eyes narrowed slightly, and she knew he didn't like her answer, but what was he going to do about it? Force her to take money? She couldn't do that to him. She'd signed on to help him. She needed to pull her share. Technically, she'd signed on to help with children of which there were none. I'm sorry you studied the lesson but didn't use it today, he said as they walked out of the church and down the sidewalk. It was a lesson I needed, so it wasn't a waste of time. She looked down at the cracked sidewalk and took a breath. Your message was really good today. I wish more people could have heard it. It definitely was a blessing to me. He took two steps before he said softly and almost with wonder in his voice, Really? It was okay? It was more than okay. It was really good. This time she looked up and met his eyes. She gave a little smile. 
and his face lit up in a grin, like he wasn't a world-renowned surgeon and actually needed and appreciated her compliment. You sound sure about that, but you also sound surprised. He was still grinning, even though he was facing forward again. Back when I knew you, I would never have thought that you would be giving a sermon. But at the same time, everything you do, I expect you'll do well. That's just the way you are. He touched her arm and stopped. She stopped with him. He leaned closer, and she was mesmerized, unable to back up, not wanting to anyway. There are a lot of things about me that are different than what they were when you and I were together. Her mouth was open, but she didn't have the presence of mind to shut it. Finally, she breathed out. Me too. They stood staring at each other. Someone walked around them on the sidewalk. A car motored down the street, but she barely noticed and certainly didn't look at any of it. Normally, she would have waved at the car and smiled at the person, whether she knew them or not. But her mind wasn't functioning in normal mode. She wasn't sure what would have happened, but his phone rang, breaking the spell that had fallen between them. With a tightening of his jaw, he reached back and pulled his phone out. Excuse me for a moment. She shrugged and backed up a step. Sure. He watched that step with lowered eyes, almost disapproving, before swiping his phone. Hello? She waded through the conversation, taking another step back and looking out along the ridges of mountains. The Ozarks were beautiful any time of year, but she wasn't really seeing them. What was going on? She knew there was still an attraction between them. She'd felt that before. But she certainly wasn't going to do anything about it. She'd already been down this road, and one thing about getting older was that she hopefully got wiser. Wise enough to not make the same stupid mistakes twice. That was the hope, anyway. She kicked cobblestones off the cement sidewalk before waving at the car that drove slowly up the street and trying to pretend her stomach wasn't growling and her heart wasn't begging her to consider giving race another chance. Finally, he swiped off his phone and shoved it in his pocket. Uh, sorry about that. Pastor Dunkel gave child services my number. They have a family of six teenagers who are looking to be placed in a home together. You don't know of anyone who wants six teenagers, do you? He asked, almost sarcastically like he knew the odds were impossible as they started walking again. No. She shook her head, wishing her circumstances were different. All the kids wanted was to keep the family they had left, the six of them, intact. I've heard about them. They're pretty determined to be together. But no one wants teenagers, let alone six. Actually, I think there are a couple ones that haven't hit the teen years yet. Yeah, his face scrunched up. 10, 12, 13, 14, 16, and 17, if I remember correctly. He blew out a breath and shook his head. Sheesh, that's a lot of kids. I hope someone takes them. It would be awful to be separated. Yeah, especially after losing your parents. But still, you have to find a pretty special couple who would take on that kind of responsibility. They made it to the mistletoe madhouse and managed to sit down and have a meal together without arguing. Although she supposed that what they had been doing in the car was just hashing things out that should have been hashed out a long time ago and coming to the conclusion that maybe no one was to blame or they both were. It was good to hear his side of the story anyway. It had definitely made her understand things a little better. He'd been hurt too. But as she drove away from the church when they were finished eating and had walked back, she decided that maybe they had become friends. She thought that she liked that. Chapter 7 I got a tree for the church. <laughs> 
Race hit send on his phone. He stared at the message he'd just sent. There was no invitation there. That wasn't what he meant. He typed some more. Would you come help me decorate it? There, that was what he wanted. It was Wednesday, and he hadn't seen Penny since Sunday. It felt like forever. He was in his mid-fifties. He was way too old to be mooning over a woman. Even if it was his ex-wife. Even if she was the kind of woman that deserved to be mooned over. He berated himself a thousand times for the mistakes of his youth. But there was no point in looking back. No point being upset about it, if he didn't fix them. If he wanted another chance, she needed him to spend time with her. That's what she'd wanted back when they were married. If he had the opportunity again, he wasn't going to let it go. Now? Sure, if you're off work. It was after five, and she said she got off at three. So, unless she was delivering a baby, she should be free. Or she might have other things she was doing. He'd never thought to ask her about that. Have you eaten? Yes. Let me finish and I'll be right there. He hadn't even thought about whether or not she'd eaten supper. He should have been more considerate. He could have offered to take her to eat first. Consideration wasn't natural to him, but neither was heart surgery. He'd had to practice and get good. Learning to be considerate and to think of Penny's feelings couldn't be harder than learning to be a heart surgeon. With his hands on his hips, he surveyed the tree that he'd managed to get in and set in the stand. He could have brought a much bigger one in, because the ceilings were high in the old church, but he hadn't thought he could manhandle something bigger and Ethan was working late tonight. He rubbed his hands down his jeans. Why was he so nervous? It was his ex-wife. He knew her as well as anyone. Except that was a long time ago. He didn't know her at all now. He was unwilling to question his motives too much. Did he want her back? Was he trying to win her affection and possibly her love? All that felt like a losing battle and made his insides clamor and twist. So he put his hands on his hips and tried to determine whether or not the tree was straight. Fifteen minutes later, the door to the church opened as he was still trying to adjust the holders on the stand. Hold up right there, please, he called from his position, squatting in front of the tree with his arm buried in prickly branches. Is it straight? Without letting go, he turned his head, brushing a sharp pine needle, and looked across the pews to where she stood in the back. Her hair was in a ponytail. She wore a loose sweater and jeans. Casual, but her cheeks glowed and her eyes sparkled, and she shone with an inner radiance that very few people achieved. She'd left him, and she'd become better for it. A little more to the left, I think, she said her head tilted to the side. He shifted the tree. <clears throat> Better? A little more. How about now? Just another half an inch. He shifted the tree again. Pine needles brushed his face and fell to the carpet. And now? Too far. It took 20 minutes before they got the tree straight, according to Penny Specs. He might have been a little frustrated, but he knew she had an eye that he didn't for decorating. He trusted her taste and discretion. She finally declared it good, and he'd crawled up off the floor. All of the decorations are back here in this closet. He brushed his hands off and walked to the back of the church, going into the vestibule. The closet there wasn't huge but Pastor Dunkel had assured him that there were enough ornaments to decorate a large tree, so there should be plenty to do the small tree that he'd gotten. I have no idea what's in here, he said. He'd managed to walk down the aisle with her without grabbing her hand, just like he'd managed to walk to the diner with her on Sunday without holding it either.
but it felt so natural to want to take it in his, and that was what he wanted to do. He didn't think she was ready for that. Maybe she never would be. Penny knelt beside him and reached for a box, pulling it out of the small closet and opening it. These are purple, pretty. She set it aside and reached for another one. More purple. Pastor Dunkle didn't tell me what color they were. She didn't seem upset with the colors. When they were married, she'd always been decorating something or other, and he had to admit he'd never paid that much attention to her. I'd kind of like to open them all so we can decide what we want to use and what we want to keep back. It looks like there's going to be more than enough to trim that tree. It didn't take long for them to pull the boxes out and for Penny to sort them according to colors. Race tried to help but felt a little extraneous as she gathered up what she wanted. When she had everything, he put the rest away, and they walked back into the sanctuary. She set the boxes down and started getting the ornaments out. Pointing to the tree, she explained how she wanted them placed. It was a relief to him that she just told him what to do, since this was definitely an area where he didn't have a clue. They worked in silence for a few minutes before she spoke. You know, I've been thinking about what you want me to do with the kids. Yeah? He asked. Was she going to quit? She seemed to be gathering her thoughts, like she was going to try to talk him into something. What in the world could it be? Well, I think we need to plan like there's going to be kids here. I'm saying let's have a whole theme for the rest of December. It won't be anything fancy, since we don't have time to prepare. We only have three Sundays, but let's have a Christmas party on one of them. Even if only one kid shows up, we're doing something. And that one kid who shows up will enjoy themselves and come back. He had to admit she was right. It was always a good strategy to plan for what you hoped for. Sure, great idea. I'm game for that. And I think we need to have things going on in January. Not just for the kids, but for the whole church. Why not? I mean, yes, it's a lot of work to go through even if only a few people show up. But it's our job. It's what we do. He could see what she was saying, and he agreed. He hadn't quite thought about it like that. He'd been kind of waiting until they got people, and then he'd start to plan things. But it made sense. Just plan like there's going to be people there, and have faith that they would show up. For the next hour while they decorated the tree, they made plans for January and February, including a couple's banquet for Valentine's Day and an indoor winter festival for the children in February. Penny had a way of infusing excitement into her ideas, and by the time they were done talking and ready to put the star on the tree, he was pretty pumped about all the things that would be going on in their church for the next three months. Almost so excited that he'd forgotten that now they had a lot of plans, but there still weren't any people coming. Here, she said, handing in the star. Can you reach the top? He reached for the star his fingers brushing hers, which was a mistake. Shockwaves flew up his arm as his eyes flew up, looking at her face. Her eyes were glued to the star like it held all the answers. He swallowed, loud in the silence of the sanctuary. This wasn't the time for him to move forward with her, although that's what he wanted to do. Close the distance and touch her like he used to have the right to running his hand over her cheek and around the back of her neck. In all the years that he'd done surgery, his hands had always been rock steady, and right now was no exception. But his knees shook, maybe with the need to move closer, more than anything else, but he resisted the urge. Her fingers pulled stiffly off the star, like it was a deliberate effort on her part and she turned away on the pretense of walking several steps and turning around, looking at the tree. He felt wobbly and disconcerted. Obviously, she didn't welcome his touch since she walked away. 
That was probably deep disappointment that was scalding the inside of his chest. Race pushed the irritating feeling aside and took a step toward the tree, reaching out. The top wasn't that far, and if he stretched just so... His legs still weren't steady, and he lost his balance as he stretched out. He tried to jerk to the right as he fell forward. He did almost miss the tree, but his leg gave out and he ended up almost head diving into it. The tree crashed to the floor a second before he landed on top of it. Inglorious, that's exactly how he felt. Penny knelt beside him, almost before he hit the ground. Are you okay? He wasn't even dazed. Everything's fine, except my ego. Are you sure? That was some fall. Go big or go home. His lips twitched. She laughed as he'd intended. I don't know, Race. I would think a world-renowned surgeon could get the star placed on top of the Christmas tree. That's not exactly a precision move. Next time, I'll let you do it. If I were doing it, I would get a ladder. I really thought I could do it without one. That was his first mistake. Although he really felt he could have done it without one, if he'd waited a little longer to get himself together after looking at Penny. It probably wouldn't do to say that, though. On the other hand, why not? You just have me all worked up because of that sultry way you blink your eyes at me. He rolled off the tree and sat up. She really did blink her eyes, like seven or eight times, and then shook her head. What? I didn't do any sultry look. You sure did. Got me all worked up. My knees were shaking so bad I couldn't keep my balance. So you're blaming me for this? She spread her arm, indicating the tree resting on the hardwood floor and the ornaments that were scattered everywhere. I sure am. That sultry look would do this to any man. He held his hands up, indicating his position on the floor by the downed tree. You're dangerous with those. And you're nuts. I couldn't do sultry if I tried. She was probably right about that. She was a fresh-faced, girl-next-door kind of girl, not a siren. She wasn't the type to cheat like his second wife, either. She was just content and happy and sweet and nice. She'd been his biggest supporter, and he'd taken that for granted. Taken it like she'd always be there, and it didn't matter if he returned anything that she gave him. You seemed okay there for a bit, but now you're not looking so good. Is everything okay? Penny leaned in a little closer, like there might be something on his face that would clue her in as to what any problem was. No, I'm fine. But then he realized she was leaning closer. That could be a good thing. He shifted. Oh, on the other hand. Yeah. She spun on her knees and looked back at him. What? Are you okay? Well, when I move, he picked his hand up off the floor a little bit. Yeah, what is it? She leaned closer. My shoulder feels a little weird. It was actually his chest that felt weird and not because of the fall. Pretty sad that an accomplished surgeon was using junior high tricks to try to get closer to the girl. Her hand came up and hovered for a second before it landed lightly on his left shoulder. No, not that one, the other one. Guilt tightened the back of his throat. There was nothing wrong with the shoulder, nothing at all. But her hand moved from his left shoulder to his right shoulder, and she pressed on it gently. Here? Not exactly. Can you move your fingers? She asked, still gently touching his shoulder. He lifted his arm up and wiggled his fingers, slowly, just so she wouldn't know for sure that there wasn't anything wrong. And that doesn't hurt, she asked. No, not at all. Where exactly did it hurt, she asked. 
her brows drawn in, her eyes roving over his shoulder and down his arm. He'd like to keep on hedging, but he just had never been good at subterfuge. Yeah, he had a lot of faults, but lying had never been one of them. I have a confession to make, he said softly, breathing deeply of her peppermint and vanilla scent. It was at once new and familiar, and elicited a longing in his soul that was stronger than anything he'd ever felt. Her eyes shot to his, her hand tightened on his shoulder. Her mouth opened in an O oh before she said, You're really hurt, aren't you? And you're trying to pretend you're not. Maybe I deliver babies, but I can handle emergency trauma. His head shook back and forth. The guilt that had been a small pinch now ballooned in his chest. He lowered his eyes. No, I'm not hurt at all. I just wanted you to be closer. I wanted to enjoy just being near you for a minute. I feel like I'm about 12. It was true. Everything he'd been doing for the last few minutes was something a junior high kid would do. Not a 50-something heart surgeon. Her hand jerked on his shoulder. He was gratified she didn't take it away. So, let me get this straight. You're not hurt at all. You were faking it? Her eyes were level with his. He remembered that beautiful emerald green. Even her position, with her hand on the shoulder and her body over his, brought back memories that he tried to push away. A whisper and a smile, the soft touch of her skin, and the slide of her hair through his hands. It was all there, right on the edge of his brain, teasing him. Race? There was concern in her voice again. Yeah, I was faking it because I wanted to be close to you, again. We tried us once. It didn't work. Her voice wasn't as strong as before. We were young, and I was stupid. I think we should give ourselves another chance. He couldn't keep the pleading out of his voice. Give me another chance. For a dozen or so heartbeats, she stared at him her lips parted and her breath going in and out, just as fast as his. Finally, she shook her head, dropped her hand, and got up. Ignoring him, she put her hands on her hips and looked at the tree. I think we can stand it up and salvage most of it. We just have to get it straight again. She wasn't going to acknowledge the attraction that flared between them. The history the idea that they could be together once more. Obviously, she was set on denying that she felt anything and ignoring the fact that he did. He couldn't blame her. Some men didn't even get one chance at a lifetime love. He couldn't expect two. Things were stilted between them as they picked the tree up, but by the time they got it straightened again and started picking the decorations off the floor, they'd fallen back into a partnership of sorts, even if it wasn't the easy camaraderie they'd shared before. This time, when he put the star on, she didn't allow his fingers to brush her hand. He took it without comment. After he put it on, without incident, they both stood back, admiring. I don't know how you do it. The way you put the colors together but it just looks perfectly symmetrical and astoundingly beautiful. Her smile was pleased, and he was happy that he could put it there. Thank you, she said, and there was no stiltedness in her tone. They stood for a few more seconds before he said, How about we go for hot chocolate to celebrate? She hesitated. Finally, she blew out a breath. <sighs> I'll be honest with you, Race. The attraction that I feel for you is the exact same attraction that I felt for you back when we were in our 20s. But I'm scared. There was a lot of pain involved with the relationship that you and I had. And I have absolutely no desire, am in fact afraid, to go through that again. She admitted attraction. <sighs> 
She was talking about a relationship. He saw those things as good signs. He hoped he wasn't pushing too hard. I can promise you this time will be a lot different than the last. She pulled both of her lips in and stood chewing on them. Worry lines deepened between her brows. He touched her hand with his before taking it and threading their fingers together. She didn't resist. He thought she might be wavering as he brought her hand up to his mouth and kissed a knuckle. Try me, please. Her eyes stayed on the tree before she turned to look at him. I'll try you long enough for you to buy me hot chocolate. How will that be? After that, we'll go from there. Fair enough. His smile was genuine. He knew he was right. He had every intention in the world of doing things completely different this time than he had the last. He wouldn't waste his chance to prove it. Chapter 8 Two Weeks Later That was a big change. We had 20 children in junior church. Penny smiled up at Race, who had his Bible and iPad under one arm and was reaching out to take the bag that she carried with her children's church stuff in it. That many? That's great. He shifted his things and grabbed her bag. I know that's all because of you and the work that you put into spreading the word and inviting people. Also, because of the plans that you made and your idea of deciding to do things regardless of whether or not there were people here. You were right. People came. His smile was relieved and happy. Her heart warmed. Working with Race for the last two weeks had been amazing. In fact, she normally loved her day job, loved talking to ladies who were expecting, loved the excitement and expectation of welcoming a new child into a family. But she had been looking forward every day to getting off work so she could come to the church and be with Race. He'd definitely been making her heart happy. It wasn't just working with him, though. It was being with him chatting and feeling that companionable camaraderie that one felt with a very good friend. There was also that attraction that sizzled between them. It added excitement to her day, and she found herself accidentally brushing him with her fingers, over his shoulder or on his arm, or touching his hand with hers. She supposed love was the same, and it didn't matter what one's age was. No, not love. Attraction. She couldn't think love. That was too much risk. Attraction was the same at any age. She just wanted to be with him and be close to him. How do you feel about going to the diner for lunch? Race asked as his fingers brushed her arm as he held his arm out, allowing her to go down the aisle first. Used to the sparks by now, her eyes still shot to his, which twinkled down at her. He'd done it on purpose. He was just as guilty as she was of accidentally brushing her at times. They'd kind of been dancing around each other, and her defenses had been coming down. I'd love to. It was the honest truth. Race really did seem to be different. He'd been attentive and considerate. He was still controlling, and he hadn't been completely perfect, but neither had she. She wasn't looking for perfection. She just wanted an honest effort. Race had definitely been putting in an honest effort. The weather had trended more cool, but the temperatures today were well above average. Do you want to walk? Race asked as they stopped at her car so she could put her things away. I'd love to. It's a beautiful day for a walk. He kept walking to his own vehicle and put his things inside. She met him there, and they walked side by side through the parking lot to the sidewalk. Their hands brushed once. She smiled to herself. With the next step, she stretched her fingers out and took his hand. Their fingers slipped together like they hadn't been apart for 20 years. It felt right, natural. 
Out of the corner of her eye, she could see him looking down at her. So she looked up, unable to keep the grin off her face. He smiled too. Words seemed to pass between them without them saying anything. Their look spoke of trust and companionship, of loyalty and dependability. He'd convinced her that he truly had changed, and for the better. Race wasn't the kind of guy who could pretend or deceive. She believed him. She thought he probably saw all of that on her face, and she saw determination on his. Determination, she assumed, not to make the same mistake again. Neither would she. She wasn't going to give up on him. He was right. He was worth fighting for. His phone buzzed as they walked into the diner. Do you mind if I get this? No, go right ahead. The words were barely out of her mouth when her own phone rang out from her purse. She laughed. <laughs> Mine's ringing too. Hopefully it wasn't a call from the hospital. Things had been pretty quiet lately, but she did have two patients who could go into labor at any time. They walked to their normal booth and sat down as he answered his phone. She swiped her phone. Hello? Hello, it's Nancy Martin. I saw you in church today, Nancy. Thanks for bringing your grandchildren. They loved it and are begging to go back, but that's not why I called. Good, okay. I wanted to talk to you at church before I left, but I needed to get them home. They were starving and needed naps. I totally understand. Penny didn't really understand, and she knew it. She'd never had children that needed to get home and fed and napped after church, but she did understand the need to leave. Is there a problem? She asked. Race's voice came across the table. He said something about not having found anyone. She wasn't sure exactly what he was talking about and was distracted with Nancy's next question. Remember the six children I told you about? The ones that were fighting to stay together and were hoping for a family to adopt them or at least foster them all? Yes. Well, they're getting really desperate. I was just wondering if you had thought of anyone or had any leads or anything. The state has already separated them and one of the children just got out of juvie for drugs. Another one is clear up in the north of the eastern part of the state with a family that she's run away from twice, trying to get back to her siblings. They're threatening to put her in juvie, too. Is there any way you can help? Penny tapped her fingers on the table. She'd made a few inquiries, but she hadn't been as diligent about it as she could have been. She would be sure to try harder. I'm sorry, it's just so hard to find anyone who's willing. One or two children, especially the younger children, are a probable yes. But six, and mostly teens? One lady just laughed at me. I'll keep looking, though. She had no idea who else she could ask. She'd exhausted everyone that she knew might possibly be interested. I'd appreciate it. It's kind of an emergency. The family's falling apart. I'll do what I can. Thank you. Penny slowly lowered her phone, swiping off. The day that had looked so bright and sweet as she'd walked hand in hand with race now looked dark and gloomy. Even the sparkly candy canes hanging from the ceiling in the diner and the Christmas music blaring out of the speakers couldn't keep the darkness from settling. It might have made it worse. Her heart went out to those children who were longing for a home. How awful, especially at this time of year. If those parents could see the kids now, they would be crying, she was sure. What's the problem? Race's voice came across the table, full of concern. His hand reached out to the middle, palm up, and she didn't hesitate. She moved her hand over and slid it into his. The attraction was there, it always was, but there was also peace and comfort that just felt right. 
I told you about the six children who were looking to find a foster home that would take them all. If you didn't, someone else did. In fact, that was what my call was about. Really? Penny's eyes got wide and her brows furrowed as she stared at him. You just got a call about them? Yeah, that was Pastor Dunkel, saying that he meant to say something to me in church today, that he had heard that some of those kids were having issues and they really needed to be placed, soon. He asked if I'd found anyone. I was going to ask you if you knew of anyone, because the few people that I know have already said no. I've even hit up doctors and other hospital staff that I know in Chicago and asked them to spread the word. Nothing. No one wants teenagers, and no one wants six kids. He shook his head, and her hand squeezed his. I just feel compelled to help them. I've already spent more time on the phone looking for someone willing to take them than I should have. I just can't find anyone. Penny tapped her fingers on the table as Race's thumb slid over her hand. That was Nancy Martin on the phone for me. She was saying the exact same thing, that they were in trouble and needed to be placed as soon as possible in a good home. What were the odds of them getting phone calls like that and at the same time? Their eyes met over the table. Neither one of them believed in coincidence. Penny sighed. It doesn't help that one of them is just getting out of juvie, I'm sure. Yeah, Pastor Dunkel mentioned that too. I don't think it's anything serious, not like he's going to shoot someone in their sleep, but a troubled teen is about impossible to place. I would take him, Penny said fervently. She'd never even met the children, but she loved them and wanted them to have the very best home. They'd been in her prayers for weeks now, but God didn't seem to be answering that one. Grace's hand squeezed hers. I would take them too, except a single dad with six kids, especially a single dad like me, who isn't exactly known for being good with kids or people in general probably wouldn't be approved as a foster parent. You're a pastor. Of course you're good with people. I'm learning to be good with people. It's what God wants. But I'm not a natural at it. I'm much more used to bossing people around. Plus, kids are a whole new ball game. Teenagers. He shivered. I don't know if I could even handle one. He looked at her. Unless... She had been looking at their hands and thinking, pondering, trying to figure out if she knew anyone, anyone at all, who might be interested. She knew a lot of really great people with big hearts who did a lot for charity and gave money and volunteered. But did she know anyone who would basically give up their life? That's what it would take. But when his voice trailed off, she looked up into those eyes that were so familiar and so beloved and it only took two seconds before she knew exactly what he was saying. Us? His brows lifted, a slight movement of his head. She clenched her jaw and breathed deep. How would that work? What would it look like? Could she do it? How would you marry me? Again? He wasn't down on one knee, and it wasn't a romantic proposal. But he was holding her hand, and she really didn't need anything more. Get married just for the children. I think you know better. He shook his head. No, I don't expect you to make assumptions. I'll tell you. His gaze was fierce. I love you. As soon as I saw you in the church, I knew I'd never stopped loving you. You feel like my soulmate. And... I know you think I didn't care, and I know I neglected you, and I know you thought that it didn't matter to me. But when you walked out, you have no idea how that broke me. I'd known all along, but I hadn't realized how much I'd taken for granted. You know I'm sorry, and you know I'm not going to let it happen again. I'd wanted to take it slow, so I could prove to you that I would be here for you that you could depend on me, that I wasn't going to neglect you, that you would be a priority 
I wanted to show all of that to you. First, before I asked you to make a commitment to me again, after I'd failed so miserably the first time. He narrowed his eyes. But it feels like the Lord is saying something to us, and so maybe I'm rushing things. But I'm not unsure about the fact that I love you, and I want to spend the rest of my life with you. His words had made tears prick in her eyes, him admitting that he'd been wrong. He'd done it before, but to hear him say that he'd been devastated and that he'd been lost without her and that he loved her now was amazing. Just for the record, I love you too. I loved you when I left, and you've always been the one in my heart. And yes, yes, I'll marry you. And yes, she laughed, I'll do this crazy thing and adopt six teenagers, because why not? He laughed along with her. I can think of a lot of reasons why not, but I guess the big reason why is that I feel like that's what the Lord wants us to do. Penny nodded. That's exactly my feeling as well. It's kind of crazy how he's worked all of this out. Race took a deep breath, then blew it out. This is a pretty big decision. Do you think we ought to sleep on it? Are you getting cold feet already? Penny smiled because she wasn't too worried about it. And this big decision, is that us getting married again or the six kids? <laughs> yes, both. I don't know. I guess if we both feel that it's God's will... We don't need to sit around and think about it. It would be foolish for us not to do it, because we don't want to not do what God wants us to do. I agree. Let's see what we can do to make it happen. The waitress bustled over just then with a notepad in her hand. I'm so sorry. Sunday lunchtime is always so crazy busy. I am so sorry I kept you waiting. She blew her hair out of her face and lifted her pad up. Can I take your drink orders? And I can take your food orders too if you're ready. Ray squeezed Penny's hand and she squeezed back before they ordered. She had a feeling that they ought to enjoy this quiet time together. If everything went as they thought it was going to, it wouldn't be long before they probably wouldn't have much time for themselves. She couldn't stop the excited beating of her heart. Was God finally going to answer her lifelong prayer? Was she finally getting children of her own? Would he work everything out for them? Despite the questions running through her head, she had total peace in her heart, and she was assured that he would. Chapter 9 Three days later. Race put an arm around Penny's shoulders. She twisted the glittering diamond on her hand, the one that they'd gone and gotten the day after he proposed. On Saturday, he'd be sliding a golden band to nestle down on her finger beside it. But for now, they were standing in the living room of his farmhouse, waiting. Two state workers were supposed to be arriving with six kids any minute. This was to be a meet and greet, supposedly to help Penny and him make up their minds as to whether or not they felt sure they would be able to foster them together. The kids weren't staying, not until they went through the waiting period and gave a definite yes. Next week. This was not exactly protocol, he'd been assured, but because of the nature of the teenagers and the number of children and his inexperience, Although Penny had fostered several children before and had an excellent record, the workers felt this was the best way. Did you talk to Ethan? Penny asked anxiously. She must have forgotten that she'd already asked that question, and he'd already answered it. No doubt she was nervous. I did. I told him he was welcome to continue living with me, or he could move to the cabin. But he said he'd think about staying. I suppose he's probably with the majority of the rest of the world, who thinks that living with six teenagers might be more people upsetting their nicely ordered world than what they want to have. 
He leaned close to her ear and said quietly, I'm not going to hold it against you if you back out. She turned toward him and put her hands on his chest. Of the marriage or the kids? Her lips tilted up in that little grin that he loved. He put his hands over hers before sliding his fingers up her arms and putting his arms around her. I just realized something. What's that? I proposed to you, and you said yes, but I have yet to get a kiss over that. He loved seeing her face light and then lift, and the smile widen and shift until she looked like she was glowing. Man, he could look at her like that every day. Maybe you should remedy that. Of all the things that I missed when I left, I dreamed about your kiss. I still dream about your kiss. Really? That makes me a little nervous. Sometimes the things we think about in our head are better than actual reality. No, the dream was every bit as good as reality, but it couldn't be better. I'd have to take your word on that. She tilted her head. I'm not against comparisons. It was his turn to chuckle. <laughs> then let's do that. Her hand slid around his back, and she stepped closer into his embrace, lifting her head and looking at him with all the stars in her eyes that she had as a young girl. Only this time, he knew how precious they were, and he hoped with everything in him that he wouldn't let her down. Not with the kids, not with anything else. Is this what's called making a dream come true? He murmured. Because it feels that way to me. She nodded as he closed the distance between them, and his lips landed gently on hers, and he breathed in her scent and her air. His world shifted and clicked into place because it felt so perfect and right. He deepened the kiss, and she pressed closer, her hands tightening on him, mirroring his desire to have her closer, have more, have everything. She made a little sound and pressed even closer, tugging on the back of his neck and pressing her body to his. The front door opened, and it took about three seconds for that to register. They broke apart, maybe a little guilty, although he wouldn't know why. Their breathing was labored as they stood looking at each other. It was a few seconds later before she spoke. Reality is definitely better. One side of his mouth tilted up in a grin. I have to agree with you there. That was really romantic, but I'm here now, so maybe we could just talk, Ethan said, then shoved his hands in his pockets. He didn't seem to know what to do with his long limbs as he shifted back and forth in front of the picture window. Hey, man, glad you could make it. It's not every day a fellow gets six younger siblings all at one time. Figured I better come check them out. Decide whether or not I'm moving out, he said with a carefree grin. Penny was pretty sure that they would have seven kids under the roof. Ethan was 20 and hardly a child, but he didn't have a home. He might as well live with them. What was one more? There were a couple of cars pulling in the drive as I walked in. I thought that might be them, Ethan said. He no sooner got those words out of his mouth than there was a knock at the door. Ethan opened it and held it while six kids and two adults paraded in. Race's eyes were drawn to the kid who had his head shaved, except for a long strand of hair that hung down to his shoulders from his ear. He also had a big skull and crossbones earring dangling from one ear and an eyebrow pierced. Maybe Race was making judgments, but he was guessing that was the kid who had been in juvie. He wasn't the oldest boy. Race would guess him to be third or fourth in birth order. Race grabbed Penny's hand, and they walked toward the children. Ethan closed the door and stepped back and to the side, out of the way. One of the ladies walked around the children with her hand out. I am Darlene Biddle. She held her hand first to Penny and then to Race. These are the Barclay children, 
let me introduce you. Although we don't expect you to remember everything all at once, so no pressure. Her tone was very businesslike, and Ray suspected it was that way on purpose. Probably there were a lot of foster parent matchups like this that didn't work out. She'd need some kind of shield to protect her heart. This is the oldest, Ruby. She's 17. Ruby gave a sweet smile, although her eyes were guarded, and Race figured she'd seen more heartache since her parents died than she had for her entire life. She gave the appearance of someone who had been sheltered. Movement out of the corner of his eye caught Race's attention, and he looked over to see Ethan shifting with his eyes caught on Ruby. Race recognized that look all too well. It was exactly the way he looked when he looked at Penny. Next, we have Denver, who is 16. Darlene pointed to a long, skinny boy that was taller than Ruby and who held the hand of what Race guessed to be the youngest girl. Sir, ma'am, he said. His voice held confidence, and he looked Race right in the eye. Race liked him immediately. Next, we have West, who is 14, and Shane, who is 13. Both of those boys said hi with almost as much confidence as the oldest brother. But still, Race could see the uncertainty in their eyes. Especially West, who had the shaved head with the hair dangling down and the skull and crossbones dangling in his ear. Race could be wrong, but he'd bet the jewelry was armor. Obviously, he had some bad experiences since his parents passed away. And the last two girls are Journey and Blakely. She indicated a little girl with long blonde pigtails, and then the one that was holding Denver's hand, who had shorter and darker hair. Neither one of those two said hi, and Blakely slid half behind Denver, hiding. Children, this is Penny and Race. They will be married on Saturday, as you know. And if things work out today, we will place you in their home next week on a temporary basis, probationary basis. We'll see how things go from there. She clasped her hands together and nodded at the other woman. We'll step away and give you guys some privacy to get to know each other. If Race had speculated as to what he'd feel when faced with six children who might become his, or would at least live in his home, he might have said, overwhelmed but looking at the faces in front of him, he just felt peace. Sure that this was exactly what the Lord would have for him. However, it worked out. Hi, this is Jay, and thanks for listening. If you're ready for another great audiobook, here's one we think you might like. Or check out the playlist with all our latest releases. Don't forget to subscribe to Say With Jay, give this video a thumbs up, and tell us what you liked in the comments.